Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just for those of you who weren't aware, Nails had to leave the conference, I think, yesterday due to a family matter. So uh, I was asked to fill in for this session, and after this, Nicholas is doing and to keep a backup session for someone else who got sick. So uh, all sorts of substitutions. But anyway, I am going to be talking about user-centered projects and how to run a project so that it's focused on a user um, this applies to whatever kind of project management style you do, whether it's Agile or Waterfall or any other kind of project management. It doesn't matter. This is more about the mindset. So my name is Crystal. I'm a user experience consultant. So I work with companies to connect them to their users and um, help them improve their businesses by doing so. You can reach me on Twitter or basically any service that requires a username. You'll find me at Kristalenka. Uh, or you can also reach me directly by email, crystal at lucid-fox.com. I, uh, I check that all the time. So yeah, I have to apologize. I found out I was doing this talk yesterday. So this was hastily thrown together. If you have any questions about it, if I missed something, that's fine. Write it down so you don't forget it, and we'll have time at the end, almost certainly. So, to start, how do we know that a project isn't user-centered? First, you see a lot of feature creep or scope creep. This is basically when in the middle of a project, the requirements change completely. You think you were building a web shop and all of a sudden you find out it's actually going to be a newspaper. And then at the end it turns into a newspaper slash web shop and you don't really know what's happening and you're just following a list of demands from your client. Uh, how many of you have this happen to you on projects regularly, whether it's web development or Really? Lately or? I'm sorry? Lately, regularly, lately or in the past? Event? Ever, really. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. That's more like it. Um, <laughs> another one would be endless revisions, whether those are really, really minor revisions, like, can you move that picture two pixels to the right? I'm sorry, maybe move it back again, and really you never moved it at all. They just want to tell you what to do. Um, and <coughs> things like they approved something three weeks ago, but they now all of a sudden want to completely change the menu structure of the site, and it's completely different. On the flip side, you could also have projects that have lack of feedback or interest, where the client really doesn't seem to care what you do. But this is a trap, because they're just not paying attention. Uh, it, it's more like they, they, they don't care, but then at the end of the project, it goes to, wait, I thought you were said you were OK with doing the, the next Facebook. And it's completely different. You also get useless feedback. I love it is just as useless as I don't care or I don't like it, because it doesn't tell you anything about why. And in general, you have a sense of dread whenever you have to work with that client. Hence the empty wine glass. I, I recently fired a client, actually, where uh, every time his email appeared in my inbox, I would just go, oh, no. What now? But obviously, this is a big problem for those of us who face these kinds of things. It, it, it makes the projects last forever. You, you don't have clear goals, you don't have clear deadlines, things are always changing, and you never really know when it's going to end. Along those lines, it's also a huge waste of time. If you try doing the endless revisions and everything, you, you end up sometimes going back to what you did hours before, and um, sad to say, I think a lot of the time the client doesn't expect to pay for all those revisions either, so you just end up wasting time. 
you don't get any joy out of it. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm working on a project or working with a client that's really good, there's this sense of pride when you finish because it's, it's a piece of work that you're proud of. But if you're not um, running a user-centered project, then it can be harder to have that sense of pride. I don't know about you, but in, in the past there are a bunch of projects that I would never admit to being involved with just say, oh yeah, no, I, I have no idea what that is. I've never seen it in my life. And most of all, it's just bad business. Like I said, sometimes clients don't expect to pay for all of the revisions that they always request. Um, you're not getting the full value of what you deserve, and they're not either. So now that you know why it's a bad thing, and I'm sure you already knew, let's see how to actually run a user-centered project. Like I said at the beginning, it's less about your methodology and more about the mindset and how you set expectations with the client. So make sure they're very clear from the beginning. I know that um, for a long time it was very popular, particularly among web developers, to just ask your clients for project requirements and basically <coughs> like have a checklist of what do you want on your site. But it's the wrong question. Don't ask them what they want um, because it gets them thinking about things from their own perspective. You'd like to get them to shift that so that they're looking at things from their user's perspective. So instead, I recommend asking them about what goals they have. Why are they building a website or an app or, or doing a design project in the first place? Uh, their, their specific business goals and then you can try and connect that with their users needs ask them if they know who their users are if they care who their audience is um, it may be that they're mistaken uh, a lot of times clients think they know who their users are but they've never actually talked to them so in that case it would be better to look at their past sales or past clients and see who is actually interacting with their company on a regular basis and that's a good starting point from there uh, and find out why these people bought their services or products in the first place if you treat it that way and if you start to look at things from the user's perspective more uh, right from the beginning with your client and frame those expectations with them it usually runs a lot better the whole way through. The next thing to do is user test. Now this will probably have a slight change in how you run your projects, um, but it's a good idea to do it early and often. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, even just taking a scribbled out wireframe and showing it to people in a coffee shop in exchange for coffee. is That's called guerrilla user testing and uh, just asking them what they would think if they landed on a website structured like that or where is the first pa place they would go. Even that will lead to insights. And then later, user testing with prototypes or beta versions, all of that helps so that you have information to um, back up your reasoning. I've actually done an entire session on why user experience is not a big scary monster and different methods for user testing and what the best way to go about it is. So if you go to this link, lucidfox.tips UX, it'll take you to the YouTube video of the session I did um, in February at Joomla Day uh, London and it basically takes you through the user experience process which you can use for your own projects. Like I said, then you have to back up your recommendations to your clients with the reasons. You can't expect them to be user-centered themselves if you're not telling them why you think this is a good thing. Even simple things like 
like we should change the color of this button, try and frame it within their own goals, which you already found out, because they'll be a lot easier to convince that way. Like if one of their goals would be to increase revenue, then you could say that they really want to increase conversions on this page for this product um, and say, okay, well, in order to do that, we should change the color of this button to something that contrasts. Uh, that sort of thing. But don't just say, oh, well, I think that this looks really good because that, that doesn't really matter. And finally, when things go wrong in the project, just gently remind them who the project is for. It's not, there's never going to be a perfect project and it's not your client's job to remember who the project is for. They're naturally going to think that it's all about them. And I guess the point of this all is that it's not. It's not about them, it's not about you, it's about their clients and meeting their needs. Because if they had no users, no clients, no customers, then they wouldn't exist as a company. So no matter what kind of project you have, keeping it user-centered helps build their business, it helps have a more sustainable business for them, and it's a lot easier for you. I said this session would be really short. I have kept my promise, um, but this means that we have a lot of time for questions that I can go more in depth with uh, for you. Does anyone have any <coughs> questions about anything? I know I went kind of fast. You would have questions if it was Jay Layouts though, right? <laughs> sure. So in agile processes, the idea is not necessarily on early testing, although it does fit a lot better into agile. It's more, I think, uh, about iteration, about making smaller changes gradually. You can still do user testing in Waterfall, and you should, because if, if you even like break down agile, you still get people who are doing say, wireframes or designs very early on, or content, and there are different sorts of tests that you can do for each, um, for each part of a waterfall process. Like for content, um, you would be focusing more on information architecture, in which case a card sorting exercise with your users would be very useful to see what the best way to organize the content of a website is, for example, um, or in the design to uh, to do an A-B test and say, okay, well, if the column, if there's a sidebar on the left versus a sidebar on the right, uh, what helps us meet our goals better um, by running it past users who preferably don't know that there's a different option. Um, and even when you get to development, I mean, you have, you have ideally, uh, quality assurance, right? You're testing for bugs and everything, but you can also run it through users because users are always better at finding bugs than we are. And, uh, and also to check interactions, if there's any kind of animation, uh, like sliding accordions and that sort of thing. There, there are tests that you can do at every step of the way. It fits more intuitively, I think, into agile processes, but you can absolutely make it work in Waterfall as well. Yes? Um, let's assume you have a, a customer and uh, they approve the wireframing. Uh -huh. They uh, approved the design. Okay. And you are working on it. Uh, you have those nice uh, buttons on the website uh, with square corners. Okay. Square corners. So after maybe two or three weeks, the customer wants one button to have round corners, uh, which would take maybe five minutes of work to make it. Mm -hmm. But to test it, you have to test it in all pages uh, at uh, four different uh, layouts for responsiveness. Um, and you don't really want to do it, of course, because you just explained that you should not do what the customer wants. What would you do with this customer, and how would you convince him to not do it, or maybe to pay for it? Uh, design's already approved, you said. Yes. In which case, I would... 
Yeah, I would, I would approach it, I would give them a choice because people like at least the illusion of choice. Um, and say, look, we already approved this, we've already tested this design and we found XYZ. Ultimately, whether a button is rounded or not probably doesn't make a huge difference in the user's experience. That's a huge assumption. It depends on the users, but, but in general, um, I don't think that would matter so much. But you would have to look at, in that case, th this is very specific, so I'm giving you a specific response. Uh, does it fit into the client's company branding? Does it fit with how their company uh, is, how they want their company's brand to feel to their users? Does it uh, make a difference on their goals, or is it just because they want it to look pretty? Because customers ask yes to all the questions. Okay, in that case, I'd be happy to implement it at an hourly rate, which you agreed upon in the contract that we set for extra revisions way back when. Um, you have to set that expectation at the beginning, I think, and say, okay, sure, if you want extra revisions, it doesn't make a difference in the UX, it doesn't really make a difference to your company's brand, um, then sure, but you have to pay for it and stick to it because ultimately it's, again, remind them, like I said in the last slide, that it's not about them. It doesn't matter if they personally think that it looks better. It's not their preference. It doesn't matter what their stakeholders think. It's about the users. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, again, if you have questions later, you can find me on Twitter or by email. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you if there's any questions that you didn't want to bring up here as well.